So what have we covered in the sequence modeling lectures? Well, if you remember, we started off with Markov models, these being a really uh, pervasive type of probabilistic model that's used for uh, sequence data. Uh, that models that observe data directly. And we looked at two different varieties of Markov model, n-gram models where our observed data are discrete and Gaussian autoregressive models for, for continuous data. These models are very, very easy to fit. Maximum likelihood fitting is, is straightforward because the, uh, the likelihood is available in a nice closed form, but they are unnatural for many uh, tasks. Uh, for instance, if you want to remove noise from a signal, um, or you want to separate signals, or your data contains latent variables, these are uh, not um, the most natural way of going about it. Let me just add a bit more color to this. Let's look at the um, issue of removing additive noise. So if you um, uh, imagine that the uncorrupted signal um, comes from a Markov model. So imagine that your un uncorrupted signal, let's call it X, uh, comes from a little Markov model, which we can specify like this. And the actual observed data is uh, a noisy version of that. Then we can write something like this. Um, if we're in sort of linear Gaussian state space land, uh, this thing might say, uh, let's use this representation yt is equal to x of t plus a little bit of noise. Um, so this, uh, this type of model, of course, instantly becomes non-Markovian for the reasons we talked about in the, um, in the lectures. It is in fact an example of an HMM. So it's sort of, as soon as you've uh, moved from considering raw signals to considering noisy versions of those signals, uh, that adds in uh, this corrupt corruption step where Y depends on X in a noisy way. And uh, if we applied the Markov model directly to this data, it would get mucked up. If we fit, fit a model now to this data, let's give a different symbol for this model, let's say Q, and a Markov model would model this using uh, say YT given YT minus one, this wouldn't perform as well as the HMM because YT is now noisy. Sorry, YT minus one is now noisy. And so when you regress on the noisy value, um, that's not really the way that the, the data uh, are generated. There's some underlying clean value, which you should really be regressing on. And that's what the, the HMM does rather than the, the Markov model. Um, so uh, the second part of the course was actually talking about these hidden Markov models now, which are structured exactly exactly like this. They provide a, a Markov model over the hidden state and then an observation model or emission distribution attached to that. These are more flexible class of probabilistic model. Something that I didn't mention at the time, but which is also interesting, is that hidden Markov models are actually a, a strictly more general uh, model than Markov models. That is to say that they can they um, contain Markov models as special cases. So let's um, just consider that for the linear Gaussian state space model again. So we'll go back to this formulation uh, at the top of this, the, the page here. Um, if your y of t has the same dimension as x of t, and this in general, of course, is given by this Gaussian, uh, and in our case, this had a mean of C times X of T and a variance equal to R. This is the, the form we use in the notes. If we set the dimension of our latents to be equal to our dimension of our observed variables here, which we're, we're free to do if we're modeling. We can set the dimension of the latent variables to be the same as the y, YTs. And then we make the following choices. We'll set C equal to the identity matrix here, and we'll limit R to zero. And in that case, this Gaussian here will become a delta function. So the rule for generating YT is it's a delta function centered on XT. So you always get copies of XT back. And what that then means is, if we were gonna uh, write down the probability of Y onto T given theta, 
that's just equal to the integral of uh, now a set of delta functions. times this transition distribution. And now we integrate this thing over x once t. And you can see we can actually do this uh, integral now because all of these are just simple delta functions. And so x is going to take the value of y once we do this integral. So let's perform the integral, give myself a bit more space here. We perform the integral and we'll get p y t given y t minus one and theta here producted over t. This is the result of doing the integral. The x's will just take the, the value of y. Um, and so what we get back here, of course, is the Markov model. It's a Gaussian autoregressive model of order one. So in the special case where uh, the covariance of the observation model or the emission distribution goes to zero um, and the C matrix goes to identity and you've got the same dimensionality of latent variables as observed variables. In that special case, uh, a hidden Markov model collapses back to a, to a Markov model. So that's a nice property if you're training this on data and your data really does come from a Markov model, given enough data, uh, your hidden Markov model will just uh, collapse back to the special case of being a Markov model. But in general, it's going to be more powerful and flexible. So this, of course, opens up these tasks which are not naturally supported by Markov models, things like removal of noise, source separation, representation, learning, and so on and so forth. There are the two different families of HMM, the discrete hidden state HMM, and the linear Gaussian state space models. And we've shown how... Um, you know, they're intimately related, just like the n-gram models are intimately related to Gaussian autoregressive models, the discrete HMM have, uh, you know, all the same types of things that a linear Gaussian state space model, um, up to some sort of edge cases to do with the different properties of Gaussians versus discrete random variables. Inference in both model classes um, requires what's called dynamic programming or results in dynamic programming. We saw examples of this, the forwards algorithm or the common filtering algorithm. This is also known as message passing. This uh, is this general principle that if there's special structure in your problem, here it being the Markov uh, relationship, you can leverage that special structure to um, to calculate things like sums or integrals uh, much more efficiently than a naive method, which would suggest they should scale exponentially in the length of the, the time series. Here, actually, everything turns out to be linear because of the, the, the Markov property. Um, finally, we have looked at maximum likelihood learning and shown that maximum likelihood learning, whether that be by the EM algorithm or by direct optimization of the log likelihood, well, that can uh, just proceed uh, using uh, smoothing as a subroutine. Um, and we can do either gradient-based optimization, as I said, or the, um, uh, or the EM algorithm, where one of those approaches is tractable, the other one will be tractable, and they are both tractable for the types of models we've looked at so far in, in this part of the course. I wanted to end by just talking about um, sort of some more recent work in this space. And, um, you know, bring out some of the, the themes that we've talked we've talked to about. And uh, this, of course, is going beyond beyond the scope of the course, but I think nevertheless interesting. So there's a, a, a really neat, neat paper by Ryan Adams, Dave Duvino and colleagues, um, which looked at using hidden Markov models to understand high dimensional video. And the application area here is a scientific application area where um, biologists are doing studies on mice in uh, cages, or here these perspex, perspex boxes, and what they want to do is sort of be able to characterize that behavior automatically based on um, cameras which set, uh, sit above the, uh, the uh, environment here. So they're going to monitor the the mice and the mice tend to behave at night. So I think it's going to be dark. So they're actually going to use infrared cameras to, to do this um, sitting above the, above the cages. And mice exhibit different types of behavior. 
um, uh, so three different types of behavior that they uh, might typically carry out in their environments here it might be standing on their back legs, it might be grooming um, themselves, uh, or it might be just walking about the, 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 uh, the environment. And what we would like to do is process these infrared videos, which are taken from above the um, environment here, and automatically determine when the mice is executing one or other of these different stereotypical movements. And then we can look at and see how you know, different training regimes or perhaps pharmacological interventions will change the behavior of the, of, the, of the mice. Will they do more of one type of activity? Will they do them in a different order? So on and so forth. And uh, the paper that I'm talking about uses hidden Markov models for this task. And this is really what I wanted to sort of drill down to. Uh, they're going to use hidden Markov models in a flexible way. So Prior, previously on our course, we've seen uh, market and Markov models with discrete states, and we've seen linear Gaussian state space models, and we sort of divided them into two separate camps. But of course, you can combine them. And in some situations like this one, it makes perfect sense to combine them. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to use discrete states here. So these are going to be discrete states that can take one of uh, k uh, values. These are going to be latent states. And these things are going to uh, capture uh, the behavior types. So these setting of latent variables here, I should say these are latent variables that we're not going to observe directly. Here, the latent variables z are going to be in state one. And state one is going to encode for uh, walking around the environment. So the animal is walking around the environment. Um, then in this sort of schematic here, the Z's then transition to a different state, to state two, and this is going to encode uh, grooming, uh, this grooming activity. And here, the states are in, uh, latent states are in state three, and that corresponds to this behavior where they're standing up on their, their back legs and sniffing around. Um, so these are discrete, uh, discrete states. Um, and in general, you might want to have as many discrete settings K as there are different types of behavior. Now, of course, as we're undertaking each one of these activities, we're not static, we're moving around. And that means these images from the depth camera, which are shown below here, are also going to change. So we need some variables in our model that are going to capture the fact that, say, if we're in state one here and we're executing a walking motion, we need to encode whereabouts the mouse is in the cage, where it, what's its um, orientation is, and so on and so forth. And so for that, we're going to use a second set of variables. These are these x variables here. These are also latent, like these ones. Um, and they're going to be uh, continuous variables. So the variables at the top here, the z's, uh, are the discrete things. They encode things more like actions um, than like a discrete state HMM. And the ones uh, below them are going to be continuous latent variables, uh, much like those that are present in the linear Gaussian state space model. Um, and depending on what uh, action you're doing, the dynamics on these um, latent variables is going to be different. It's going to be modulated by the action that we're doing. Um, so, you know, the configuration essentially of the rat, which is encoded by the X's, this is basically going to encode the pose uh, of the, uh, is it rat or mouse? I think I'm interchanging this here. Pose of animal is going to be coded by X and the typical pose which that animal uh, takes is going to be controlled depending on what action it's trying to uh, take place here. And then the, the data here, the observables, which we're call Y, um, all the way up to yt here. These are going to depend in a non-linear way, actually, on the pose of the animal. And they're actually going to use a little neural network in there to, to uh, um, describe the relationship between the pose variables x and the depth camera uh, measurements at the bottom. And in this way, then, you can instantiate this model. You can train it using ideas like message passing and direct optimization of the likelihood and things like that. And uh, although I sort of said that these discrete variables at the top um, 
uh, sort of a, I gave the impression maybe that they hand code each one of these different behaviors. In actual fact, you can learn this in a data-driven day away from data, and you can learn automatically representations of actions in this space and use them to monitor lots of different animals, you know, constantly over a 24-hour period and provide segmented video back, which you know, uh, tells you how long the uh, animal has spent doing each one of these behaviors and how do they transition between, between these behaviors and so on and so forth, therefore saving you lots of uh, automatic labeling time that uh, is doing the, the labeling automatically rather than doing it in a way that would require brute force. For more about this, follow this uh, video link at the bottom. Um, thanks for listening.